We're looking forward to this meeting. How's the weather down there? <laughs> Scott, it is just lovely. I think it's about 75. There's a bit of a breeze. We just returned from a one mile walk and uh, we'll spend a little time over by the pool this afternoon, I think. Well, it's 46 degrees here. Oh yeah, I'll choose this. Come visit one us. One year ago, we had the ice storm. That's right. That's right, we did. We did. Yeah, we Happy just... birthday, Angelo. Thank you. All right, let's get this meeting started, ladies and gentlemen. There's our bell. Hello, fellow Rotarians. My name is Reed Miller, and I am your president of the Rotary Club of Portland. Welcome to everyone who has joined us here today via Zoom. We are glad to have you with us here today. And just a reminder for any of you that were not able to attend last week's State of the Club meeting, we will be meeting in person only on the first Tuesday of the month moving forward. All of our other weekly luncheons will continue to be virtual. Again, I want to remind everybody that this decision was made for a variety of reasons, but the finances ultimately forced the decision. The more attendance that we get in our in-person meetings, the quicker that we'll be able to return to our meetings in person with regularity. Alrighty, on that note, I will now ask that you all join me in reciting the four-way test. Thank you, Skylar. Number one, is it the truth? Number two, is it fair to all concerned? Number three, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And number four, will it be beneficial to all concerned? All right, thank you, Skylar. And continuing with our International Service Committee Month, I would like to invite Rotarian Tom Hoggard, a member of the International Service Committee, to the virtual podium to present today's reflection. Welcome, Tom. And Tom, I think we got you on mute. Uh, if you could just hit that mute button, I think we're ready to rock. There we go. Hello, everybody. <laughs> well, what are the four things that these following things have in common? Mahatma Gandhi, Valentine's Day, the US military, and the Rotary. Gandhi has said, be friends with the world and regard the whole human family as one. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. Your actions express your priorities. Valentine's Day is a symbol of love and friendship. Our US military on a yearly basis performs humanitarian projects around the world. These involve all of our branches of the military, public health, allies, medical personnel. On one such mission, I was appointed officer in charge of a large project in the Solomon Islands on, on the island of Aki, where there was scant medical care and lots of people. To my delight, Rotary International had supplied and helped the only hospital pharmacy on this island. Because of our large uh, medical contingency and my involvement with the Rotary, we were quickly befriended by hospital staff and thousands of patients with whom we worked and treated. This resulted in long-term positive feelings and friendship for all concerned. So what do Gandhi, Valentine's Day, the military and Rotary have in common? They all intersect into the four-way test. Our Rotary puts priorities into action through service to others. We are friends of the world and the whole human family. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Tom, and uh, great to have you back with us. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we appreciate that timely reflection and, and tying those things together. That was a wonderful reflection. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. All righty, and at this time, I'm going to ask any visiting Rotarians and guests to please raise a virtual hand to introduce yourselves. All right, let's give a moment to introduce our guests. Do we have any guests with us here today? I know, I think in our pre-meeting, uh, Daniil had somebody to introduce, I think. 
Well, um, Carol Salter will actually introduce uh, Heath, uh, an international partner from the Marin uh, uh, County Evening Club. All righty, we will, we, will, uh, we will wait. A little bit of uh, time to build up that guest. All right, looking forward to it. Anyways, welcome to any of our guests joining us today virtually. We appreciate you all being with us here today. All right, so yesterday was Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's to all, and to all a happy Valentine's Day. Looks like we all made it off the couch after we are undoubtedly stuck to it for most of the day on Sunday. Hope you all had the opportunity to eat a bunch of delicious food and enjoy a fantastic halftime show. Game turned out to be great uh, with action right up until the final whistle. Unfortunately, my Super Bowl party was canceled due to a large contingent testing COVID positive. Uh, and then last night, my Valentine's Day plans were canceled at the last minute when our babysitter let us know she was COVID positive. Turns out it's pretty difficult to get a reservation for Valentine's Day on the day of. Finding a babysitter even more difficult. However, being the eternal optimist that I am, I decided to make the most of it. On Sunday, still grilled up some delicious marinated short ribs, got to actually pay attention to the game, the commercials, and the halftime show. I would have expected uh, hosting and socializing to get in the way of those things. So that's a positive. I was able to have real quality time with my family versus having to share them with the rest of the party. And last night, Valentine's Day, when our babysitter fell through, it meant we were able to spend more quality time with our boy. When we put him down for bed, I picked up Italian food and we enjoyed a nice distraction-free meal together with just my wife and I. In my opinion, Valentine's Day is about quality time with the person or the people that you love. It's not about where your reservation is for or how much money you spend on them or the Instagram post or the, or the flowers or the new jewelry. It's about an attitude of gratitude and letting them know how much they mean to us. Well, that's what, it's, that's what it's about to me. Because if we're being honest, Valentine's Day was created as a means for revenue. But why can't we be romantic and make the most of it? For those of you that are not the romantic type or who spent Valentine's Day alone, well, you have a lot to be optimistic about. Think about all that money you just saved. Okay, well, I hope you all had a great weekend and that Monday got your week started just right. And now on to Tuesday, we are in the month of February. It's time to celebrate our Rotarians who joined our club in the month of February. Skylar, can you show us the birthdays, our Rotarians that are celebrating in the month of February? And yes, hello to Mike's brother. All right, there's our birthdays. Check it out, take note, pick up the phone, call your fellow Rotarians, let them know you're thinking about them, we care about you, happy birthday. A lot of these names I'm seeing up here are people that are not in attendance in our weekly meetings here. Give them a call, tell them happy birthday, tell them we miss them, invite them back to our Rotary meetings, we'd love to have them. All right, thank you, Skylar. And on that note, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't bring it up one more time. Very special birthday to Angelo Carella. Happy 90th. All right, inspiring, something we can all strive for. Still smiling, still out getting those miles in in the morning, being active, I love to see it. All right, Angelo is a past president of our club, past district governor for District 5100, host club chairman for the Rotary International Convention held in 1990 here in Portland, and has been highly involved in the organization of many Rotary events over the years. So uh, again, special happy 90th to uh, a treasured member of our club, uh, happy birthday, Angelo. All right, now I'd like to hand it over to Rotarian Carol Salter from the International Services Committee. Welcome, Carol. Thank you so much. Um, I am honored today to introduce our five-minute speaker, Keith Axtell. He's the past president and current international chair of the Marin Evening Club, and he's also an expert on Rotary Global Grants. 
Um, he's been a leader in organizing international humanitarian projects through the Rotary and is currently the head of District 5150's technical cadre for global grants. He's managed over 30 different projects in Latin America through the Rotary Matching Grant, and he's been recognized because of his work there with the Rotary's highest honor, the Rotary Service Above Self Award. Both him and his wife, Polly, live in Corte Madera and are major donors to the Rotary Foundation. So he's going to update us on two club-supported efforts going on in Ecuador. Please join me in giving Keith a warm Rotary welcome. Keith. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, your club has been a uh, very strong supporter of some of our humanitarian work in Ecuador, particularly in the area of uh, business development and microcredit. So I have a uh, little slideshow about the project that you uh, have assisted us with, actually been two projects, uh, both similar in the uh, south central part of Ecuador, uh, one large project in Guayaquil, Ecuador, which is our largest city, and the other is in the Santa Elena province, which is just uh, next to uh, uh, Guayaquil. Uh, in both cases, uh, we work with the same local operating agency called Hogar de Cristo uh, that uh, assisted with providing the uh, development activities that we were supporting through our financing and planning. Uh, the target of the first project was a very large slum area in Guayaquil. Uh, many, many people have moved from the Andes and the uh, other parts of Ecuador to Guayaquil looking for work and they couldn't find it. So they've got a area with a high unemployment rate and very bad living and working condition, conditions. And the goal of this project was to help people by setting up small uh, businesses where they could make something to earn a better living than if they're just maybe selling something or working for someone else. And we used a program uh, previously set up by Hogar de Cristo for a seven month business development program to basically take people off the street who had an idea and had motivation and who wanted to work and give them an opportunity. Uh, our budget was $82,000, which was mainly for the microcredit financing for the project as Hogar de Cristo had other funds for the training. We did assist with a little bit of the training. And the financing came from the Rotary Foundation and a, uh, a number of Rotary clubs. And as I said before, your club was a substantial donor to assist us with this particular project. The participants went through uh, basically four stages in, uh, in proceeding through this program. They first received the uh, uh, several weeks of training in planning a business, identifying a particular business that might work for them and uh, assuring the feasibility of it. Uh, and then they actually receive vocational training in making something uh, in order to uh, provide them the technical skills they needed to succeed in, uh, in their manufacturing or craft business. Uh, when they completed uh, three phases here, uh, then they would receive the microcredit loans once they were really established. And I, sh I should say that this uh, program was not really set up to help individual people set up businesses. The target was to help groups of people set up businesses. They found that that's been more successful in the longevity of the businesses when they were setting up partnerships or three or four, or even more people working together in one business. And once the business got up and rolling, then they received uh, mentoring and the business uh, assistance, marketing assistance from Hoga de Cristo to help them uh, uh, follow through on the training they received to remind them and assist with client relations and sharpening their skills in business. Here's some examples. Uh, a number of the people were trained in, uh, in shoemaking because there was a good market opportunity in Ecuador at that time, particularly making sandals. This uh, Guayaquil is a very hot area generally, so sandals were very much in, uh, in demand. And here's one group that's uh, making sandals, and you can see they've got a pretty reasonable 
uh, looking product here. Uh, another group of women made backpacks and they were so successful with this that they were able to get a contract with a national retail uh, outlet to market their backpacks throughout Ecuador. And that was really the goal of this program was to uh, set these businesses up on a permanent sustainable basis. Uh, three or four of the groups uh, ended up making disinfectant because there was a good market for that uh, in, this, uh, in this area where they were living. So these were little local businesses serving local needs and, uh, and doing well as a result of it. And then these ladies set up a bakery and made bread and cookies to sell uh, in, their, in their area. So this was uh, turned out to be quite a successful program. We were able to establish 87 small businesses as a result of uh, the support that we received and the assistance from Hogar de Cristo. And over 600 people completed the seven month business development training program. And I've got to say that must have taken a lot of motivation and interest for them to, uh, to be able to complete that length of a course. And through the period of time of our project, which ran from about 2015 through 2017, uh, we were able to make over almost a quarter of a million dollars worth of loans to these small businesses that were established, the 87 small businesses. And that reflects uh, a revolving loan fund that was established uh, and the high payback rate that uh, we experienced in these businesses. So we were able to loan the money out uh, over and over several times. So our second project, which is a new one, uh, just started in September of last year, uh, is in the St. Helena province, right next door to Guayaquil, uh, with the same concept of establishing small manufacturing and craft businesses. And the target at this point was to uh, help 100 people uh, with setting up businesses. And these were more aligned toward individual shops or small group shops rather than the uh, large, larger organizations. And again, Hoga de Cristo was our operating agency and our partner here was the Rotary Club of Salinas, Spondilas. But in this case, we also had partners of the uh, local government, so basically city and county organizations helped with providing space, helped with providing outreach and actually provided some of the training to our recipients as well. It's turned out to be a very good partnership program. Uh, here's some of the training that uh, uh, was taking place in September, October when they were getting started. They used full COVID protocols here, as you can see, spacing people and uh, everyone wearing masks. They've got a very uh, thorough uh, orientation on pricing, marketing, and uh, small group workshops to uh, really help them understand the importance of uh, pricing out the prices of their, uh, their uh, goods properly. A number of these people were in the uh, food service area, setting up little restaurants or, or doing uh, gastronomic uh, food production out of their homes. And this is our first very excited uh, graduating class, as you can see in the back. And this was about October. And these people in front with the uh, kind of maroon uh, golf shirts are students from the local university. Uh, there were a lot of partners in this project and these students assisted with the training and mentoring uh, these uh, new business people as well. <clears throat> so current status, I say is still currently being implemented out of the 100 target. Uh, 700, uh, 70 people have been trained uh, in business, the first phase of the training. Uh, and that was the business planning and general orientation to business. Uh, 31 people have completed phase two training, which is much more detailed in uh, the legal requirements of setting up a business and all the taxation requirements in Ecuador. Uh, 30 people have taken specific training in gastronomy and sewing. Uh, they need a class of about 10 to uh, do the technical training. So uh, these are the uh, groups where there was enough interest to warrant the vocational training. And so far, uh, 
uh, they've loaned out about twelve thousand dollars in uh, in the loan fund so far to uh, to the businesses participating. And in December, they held an entrepreneurial fair, which was kind of on the uh, uh, seaside walk in uh, Salinas. And thirty five of the businesses that are now participating in this program uh, showed their wares at this. Uh, entrepreneurial affairs. So between uh, August, September, and December, the uh, program has come very far. So we're very pleased with the progress and particularly that very pleased that you're willing to support us in uh, doing this uh, good work to help people help themselves in, uh, in the lower low income communities in Ecuador. So thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, help celebrate uh, International Month with you. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate welcome. you being with us here today, Keith. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to, uh, to share that with us. That is uh, an incredible story, incredible work that you all are doing down there in Ecuador, and uh, the numbers speak for themselves. I mean, it's truly inspiring the amount of people's lives that you are changing down there. Um, the amount of businesses that you have made possible. And, uh, you know, I, I know that those numbers don't necessarily reflect um, when you talk about the business being able to be possible, all the different people that work for that business and all the different families that are affected by that business. And uh, it's just incredible work that you all are doing down there. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. My, my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Absolutely. All righty. Thank you so much for that, Carol. And uh, thank you, Keith. And uh, great to hear about all that great work that our International Services Committee is doing to help around the world. And next, I would like to welcome Rotarian Curtis Shiree to speak about Enterprise Academy. Welcome, Curtis. Good morning, everyone, everybody. Uh, like, like Reed said, I'm here speaking about our Enterprise Academy camp. Obviously, that's been an event that's been going on for several years now, as many of you know. What, what we do is we work very closely with uh, Portland Public Schools and a lot of other high schools in the uh, Portland area to put on this entrepreneurial based camp where we teach uh, up to 100 kids on how to grow and develop a business. Obviously, with COVID, that's been incredibly difficult this year, but we're really, really proud of the work we've done so far. We, I think this is the first year. Uh, we were just talking about it that we are completely full for applications. Uh, we have a we have a, a pretty pretty deep wait list as well. Um, of those kids, the vast majority of them are from underrepresented communities, BIPOC, and things of that nature. Uh, this is also the first year that we can say that uh, our counselors are majority BIPOC, our speakers are majority BIPOC, our panelists are majority BIPOC, and our students are majority BIPOC. I don't think a Rotary event can check all those boxes or has checked all those boxes to now, up uh, to now. So I, we're very, very proud about that. Um, it's going on March, March uh, 4th to the 6th. Uh, we are looking for all sorts of help, um, treasure time. Uh, we need volunteers to come out and watch these. A big part of the camp is the kids put on a presentation of their products on the final Sunday. I uh, would need people to come out and do that. Uh, we need help developing prizes for these winning teams. Uh, so big, big ask for the entire club at this point. Uh, we really, really need some help. So please reach out um, if that's something that you're willing or uh, capable of doing. Like I said, very, very proud of the work that we've accomplished so far um, and, the rep and the amount of uh, representation we've been able to accomplish as well. So please reach out and uh, thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you so much, Curtis. Uh, appreciate you sharing that with us today. And uh, I will piggyback on what Curtis said there. I've been out to the Enterprise Academy before as a consultant and uh, probably my most fond memory as a Rotarian, to be totally honest, it was an incredible experience. Um, the work that our club does for these kids is absolutely uh, amazing. And uh, it's, it's an incredible opportunity for these kids in high school to, uh, to get exposure to the real business world that uh, they don't typically see in the classroom. And so for them to have access to uh, a group of professionals to consult with them and to guide them and to, to provide advice, uh, over the course of the weekend, you watch these kids grow a tremendous amount. Uh, it's really impressive. Uh, it's an, an awesome program that we put together. So uh, I highly encourage, like Curtis said, they're looking for volunteers. Um, it will be time very well spent. I promise you that. 
Um, the kids are going to get a tremendous amount out of it. So if you want to change some lives, it's a great opportunity to do that. Uh, get signed up right now. I can't encourage it more. Okay, again, thank you so much for that update, Curtis. And I'd like to now invite Rotarian Will Nolan to the virtual podium as your chair of the day. Welcome, Will. Hello, everyone. I am happy to welcome Carrie Timchuk back to our Rotary Club. Carrie is the executive director of the Oregon Historical Society and a native Oregonian who was raised in Reesport and graduated from Willamette University with a law degree in 1984. And back when bipartisanship was still considered a virtue, he was deeply involved with politics at both the national and state levels. He had a long relationship as a speechwriter to both Elizabeth and the late Senator Bob Dole, was chief of staff to Senator Gordon Smith, and has served in numerous other capacities at the state level since returning home to Oregon. Additionally, he has assisted the Doles and Oregon business leaders, Gert Boyle, Harry Merlot, Al Reeser, and Ken Austin in writing their autobiographies. When his name came up in the program committee to speak again, someone asked what he would talk about. We were all in agreement. That didn't really matter. After all, he is a four-time Jeopardy champion. Whatever he chose would be interesting and educational. Like his last talk in 2020, when he spoke about Oregon's history with Black Americans. It was one of the most informative and eye-opening eye talks I have heard at Rotary, and it had me taking notes like I was back in school and prepared again to do so. So fellow Rotarians and guests, please help me welcome back Carrie Timchuk to talk with us about whatever he wants to talk about. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Will, for that nice introduction. It's great, it's great to be back. And you know what, given that yesterday, uh, not only Valentine's Day, Reed, but more importantly for us here, Oregon's birthday. Uh, yesterday was uh, statehood day. Oregon became a state on February 14th, 1859. That's correct. Sorry, the 163rd birthday. Yeah. Myself, I don't think we look a day over 110. So I think we've held our age, age pretty well. Uh, interesting fact, although we became a state on Valentine's Day, that's when President Buchanan signed the uh, declaration after Congress passed it, making Oregon a state, word did not reach Oregon for a month later. Of course, this was 1859. So the first word went from, by telegram from uh, DC to St. Louis. The telegram was then given to the Pony Express. They took it to San Francisco. Then by ship, a ship named Brother Jonathan brought the news up to Portland uh, sometime in March was by the time when Oregon uh, finally received word, received word that we had become a state. Uh, so that things were a bit, bit different back then. Um, what I thought I'd do today is give you an update on all things that are going on here at OHS uh, in honor of our, our birthday yesterday. And there's quite a lot going on and uh, talk about the roles that we play here. And I'm gonna press share screen and see if this works. Uh, Share. All right, how's that? Everybody see that? Am I still there? You can see the screen, great. And hopefully this will work. Uh, let me, uh, I'm not the, the, the most tech person. I'm gonna see if this works. No, that didn't work. Hang on. Hang on. Sophie, help. I may be a Jeopardy champion, but I'm not an IT expert. So, uh... Harry, it's, yes. it's Drew. Hey, Drew, how are you? While you're waiting, can I put a plug in for what you're doing for us for more? And I will mention it too. I, I all right, for our 75th, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to you. Okay, uh, my, my high level tech thing is here, so. Screen sharing, I don't know how that ended. Um, wait, do you need the PowerPoint? I just, I need my slides, yeah, so. Carrie, you're still showing your screen. You may need to uh, stop screen sharing and uh, start over screen sharing. And okay, I think we got it now. Here, hang on. Just a second here. Oh. Let 
My back, and then how do I change pages? You're back, and we've got your presentation. That's what happened? Looking good. I might just hit the wrong button. I just press that. Got it. Okay. After that brief interruption, so give you a, a little bit of what OHS update. First of all, of course, what many people know us as is a museum, world class museum here in downtown Portland. Uh, on the screen there is a picture of our uh, signature exhibit called Experience Oregon which is about two years old, uh, was, was put in uh, uh, two years ago after to replace the old one. It's received two national awards as one of the best new exhibits in the country. It's very uh, open and honest uh, as we need to be. As I say, we are not the Chamber of Commerce, we're not the Tourism Bureau, we're the Historical Society. And our job is to tell the true history of Oregon, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And spoiler alert, there's been a lot of ugly over the years, but uh, so which we talk all about all things Oregon history in this exhibit. Uh, it begins with a from a little geology of Oregon. The first artifact you see is a pair of the Fort Rock sandals, uh, which are a kind of a, a sandal and a half found at a dig in southern Oregon and carbon dated to over 9000 years old. Uh, one of the first art artifacts we have. Uh, indigenous people have been here since time immemorial. Uh, we tell the stories, of course, of the nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon, and we try to tell everyone's story as we move through Oregon history. It's a great exhibit. You could literally spend a day or two days in there and still not see it all, press every button, a lot of interactives, uh, really worth your, worth your while. Uh, open now, uh, just in time for the Winter Olympics as a temporary exhibit called Freeze the Day, a history of winter sports in Oregon. Uh, you know, sport, winter sports are part of Oregon's culture from the mountains to ice skating. We tell the story of uh, the Portland uh, Rosebuds before the Winter Hawks, before the Buckaroos, were the Portland Rosebuds, Portland's first hockey team that actually played in the first Stanley Cup, losing the Montreal Canadiens in 1916. Uh, who knew that uh, out there? Uh, uh, and talk about the ski resorts and uh, Oregon Olympians. And yes, in case you're wondering, there's even a little thing on Tanya Harding. So uh, we tell her story as well. So a, a really fun exhibit about the history of winter sports in Oregon. Also that opened on January 14th, it's a coming soon, it's already opened. A wonderful exhibit of paintings from Frances Stilwell. She's a wonderful lady from Corvallis who has devoted her uh, art career to painting the Eco, the eco regions, the flora and fauna of Oregon. She paints outdoors, looking at the scenery, and we have 80 of her paintings. Uh, beautiful display. It kind of calms you down to see these beautiful paintings. And if you need a place to forget the pressures of the day, uh, this exhibit's a, a great place to do it. Uh, other temporary exhibits uh, going on. We have uh, an exhibit we did, did in partnership with a group called Jobs with Justice celebrating their 30 year anniversary of a, a labor union here. As Drew was about ready to mention, uh, Morrison Child and Family Services, a wonderful organization, social service organization. I was proud to be a board member for a number of years, celebrating 75 years of service this year and uh, opening up very soon, as you can see, February 18th. Uh, the installation is going on now. I was watching our crew install it uh, today. Uh, Drew, anything else you wanna add about that? Nope, well then, and then uh, you another, did fine. Thank there you, you go. Okay. Another organization uh, celebrating a great anniversary, Special Olympics Oregon, is celebrating 50 year anniversary uh, here, here in Oregon this year. And we partnered on an exhibit with them telling the really inspiring story of Special Olympic athletes here in Oregon. And then coming soon in, in March, an exhibit, another great organization that Drew is familiar with, the Blanche House celebrating the 70 year anniversary and we'll tell their story as well. We also uh, are as the kind of the big brother in the state of all historical societies, we ship around traveling exhibits to smaller museums. Uh, this is the centennial year of Mark Hatfield. Uh, Senator Hatfield would have turned 100 this coming July. So on his 99th birthday last July, we opened up a traveling exhibit uh, that is going around the state and also here at our museum. Uh, telling the story of the life and legacy of the gentleman who certainly was Oregon's gold standard when it came to public service. 
You can see it's been at PS, that's PSU this month when we traveling to Pendleton. It's booked for the en entire year. And so booked that we beta had another one produced and which is now uh, here at OHS. We have a traveling exhibit called Oregon is Indian Country, which travels the state throughout the year, now down in Curry County and in, in Brookings and Gold Beach. And then we have a traveling exhibit. Uh, it's the 50th anniversary of the Bottle Bill, uh, one of the landmark pieces of Oregon environmental legislation. And so we have an exhibit that's traveling around the state and uh, telling the story of that, of that environmental uh, bill. We, along with being a museum, we are also a world-class research library. Our library opened up uh, that meant last October 15th. It was closed for a year as we did a total redo of the library, modernizing it. Uh, fascinating place to go to do research uh, on any scholars use it, students use it, general public use it. There's a, a lot of people now who come in and do what I call house history, house gene genealogy. Say they bought a house at you know, 832 Hawthorne and they come over and uh, look through our records as the photographs we might have of that neighborhood, blueprints of their house, who knows? We have so much material here. Uh, so that's been a popular uh, pastime for folks to come over here and le learn about their neighborhoods. We also provide uh, curriculum and information to schools. Uh, during normal, of course, pre-COVID times, we have thousands and thousands of school groups coming through uh, annually. Uh, since COVID, of course, that's, that's been stopped. So we take uh, this, the history to the classrooms, providing teachers with uh, curriculum and through our digital assets, our website, our digital collection, uh, that they can uh, teach history uh, with our assistance. More there on the curriculum, you can see, nevertheless, they persisted, was an exhibit we had on the history of women's suffrage in Oregon. We do a whole curriculum on based on our experience Oregon exhibit. And Racing to Change uh, was an exhibit we did with Oregon Black Pioneers telling the story of African-American history in Oregon. And we provide a curriculum to that on classrooms as well. H history Day is coming up. We have an Oregon History Day and a National History Day akin to the National Spelling Bee, only all about history. Uh, we are the sponsors of it here in Oregon. and. Uh, it's a great, uh, great competition. A couple of Oregon kids have won the national title here in the last couple of years. Uh, this year again, it will be virtual. It says in-person contest that has changed recently to virtual again. And we're looking for judges. If you would like to be a judge and see about, uh, help out these fascinating projects, uh, information there, uh, you've got to get about an eight hour commitment over the course of five days, it says there. And there'll be a judge orientation it says April 20th, 2021. Of course, we mean 2022 down there. Uh, and there is a website there. If anyone wants to uh, reach out and you'll, it's amazing what these junior high kids and high school kids do. Uh, documentary, they make these documentaries that are almost professional and papers and visual aids there, as you can see this guy judging. So if you got some volunteer time, it's a great, it, that'll restore your faith in the, in the youth today. One of our great assets is Oregon Encyclopedia. Uh, it's uh, www.oregonencyclopedia.org. It's kind of Wikipedia for all things Oregon. Uh, only every article is peer reviewed and true, true history. And our OHS website there is on top. And you can see on the bottom that OE 100,000 visitors almost in January to the OE website. We're getting over a million visitors a year reading about uh, so many uh, fascinating articles uh, in entries about Oregon topics. Uh, gives you an example of what people are looking at. This is our most viewed page on our OHS website in January. Uh, look at that, what we can learn from the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, which was first put on our website uh, almost two years ago in April, 2020, when COVID kicked off and it's still getting, look at the people viewing that each, each month. The Hatfield Historians Forum, uh, we have a great series. We bring four outstanding historians out to Oregon. That was COVID in the past two years, but we're back live and in person this year. You could also buy a ticket to watch virtually. Our first lecture was February 1. Uh, Frederick Logoval, his fabulous book on John Kennedy. On March 1, we have Eric Larson, one of America's favorite historians, talking about his best-selling book, La Splendid in the Vile, about Winston Churchill's first year in office. And you can see other uh, 
other items that are on our top top 10 list of January that, that were on our website. And then this, I love this, the top 15 entries on the Oregon Encyclopedia for 2021, for all of last year. Look at the most frequently visited entry on the Oregon Encyclopedia, Bigfoot. The old Sasquatch was, number, was the number one entry uh, on the encyclopedia, most frequent visitors. Uh, number two, the Oregon Trail makes sense. And you can see some others there, uh, the most frequently visited. Animal House, the movie, which was filmed, of course, in Eugene and Springfield. Uh, and then Rattlesnakes. I, I don't like snakes. I don't understand why people would want to go to look at rattlesnakes, the entry on rattlesnakes on our Oregon Encyclopedia. But seriously, a great way to spend a weekend is just dive into the Oregon Encyclopedia and go from article to article. Uh, just fascinating information. We just put open a museum collection portal. Uh, and put 10,000 items. We have some 85,000 items in our collection, artifacts in our collection. And we've already got 10,000 items up with high level photos, uh, information about their history, their provenance. Uh, you can type in any type of topic, Oregon Trail, Lewis and Clark, and up will come the items uh, in our collection that relate to that uh, category. And you can see already in January, people, in first, just one week in January, people were going on online and got a lot of news coverage that drove people to find out what we have in our collection. Uh, as, as they look at our digital collection, you can see that 59% are from Oregon, other Western states, but 90% uh, from the United States. We had visitors from all 50 states, 154 countries, uh, accessing uh, the OHS collection via our uh, digital website. Just an example of some of the photos we have online in our digital collection. And the number one most popular uh, view was glass negatives of early Portland homes. Uh, that received a lot of news coverage and led to a, just an outpouring of interest and in people trying to find, and actually did find their homes in their neighborhoods from these photos from the early 1900s. I love number four, the exploding whale. Uh, 20, 2021 was the 50th, uh, 2020 was the 50th anniversary of the exploding whale, uh, that great uh, blasted bits of blubber as Paul Lindman called it when he covered the story. Uh, we had a great program with Paul uh, via Zoom and thousand people from across the world turned in. People can't get enough of watching that whale explode. The Oregon Historical Quarterly is our publication that comes out four times a year. It's been published for over a century, uh, great, great history and our issue this winter was a whole special issue on the story of the Chinese American population in Oregon. Uh, similar to the one we did a couple of years ago, a special issue on uh, white supremacy in Oregon. But this issue has been receiving a lot of attention from uh, Chinese American community here in Oregon and throughout the, the Northwest. It's a, it's the OHQ is, uh, goes to all, if you're a member of OHS, you receive the OHQ. A lot of folks remember, I get asked a lot about the African-American heritage quilt. Uh, it was uh, stolen when, when we were vandalized back in October of 2020. Uh, it was a quilt done by 12 African-American ladies with squares uh, saluting their, their African-American heroes. It was dragged out into the rain and left in the rain by the vandals. Uh, thankfully, the police found it and returned it. Uh, we had to ship it off to a conservator back in Massachusetts because it was as you might imagine, very heavily damaged, being out in the rain, a huge rainstorm for several hours. It has now been returned in much better uh, condition. It will not ever be uh, the condition that it was. Uh, there was too much uh, running of colors and damage done to it. But that is now part of the story of the quilt and we will uh, forever care for it and we'll occasionally display it uh, as we tell, tell that story. Stop sharing now and go back. Uh, if uh, see if anybody has any questions, uh, you can either through uh, chat, I guess, or ask me. I don't know how you, how you do it. We'd we'll love to answer any questions you might have. Uh, I've got the. I see Al Jubitz thanking me for uh, uh, being the master ceremonies upcoming up in April. Uh, we will host with Portland State. Uh, 
celebration of life and legacy of Elizabeth First, former Congresswoman First, who passed away last year, uh, kind of not from COVID, but during COVID. So there wasn't any big honoring of Elizabeth and we're gonna be doing it uh, in April. She was a history maker, the first person ever elected to the United States Congress who was born in Africa. Uh, just a wonderful lady, a great friend of mine and we're proud to help honor her. If I could uh, just ask a question. <clears throat> Terry, thank you for that. And uh, I just wonder, uh, yeah, I've been I'm on very interested in, uh, hey, Scott, buddy, mute. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, very interested, uh, Carrie, in the uh, peace history of the state of Oregon. I know I could be catching you by surprise here, but Elizabeth First was a founder of the Oregon Peace Institute, Correct. as yeah. you know, and uh, very much a social justice person, right. uh, beginning in her uh, birth country of South Africa and also uh, with Native Americans, a uh, strong supporter of Native American rights. So uh, uh, if you have anything to say about other great peace leaders like Mark Hatfield, uh, Wayne Morris, or anyone else you may be uh, thinking of, uh, please let us know. You bet, yeah, the Hatfield exhibit, we certainly mentioned his, that was part of Hatfield's legacy as well, of course, was his opposition to war, uh, which came when he was serving in World War II and was one of the first Americans to go into Hiroshima. Uh, after, after after the bombing, so uh, his his story as well is an important one. So, other questions? Um, well, Gary, I, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Uh, can you hear me? You bet. Okay, um, I'm sure the stories have been done on this, but um, there's a wonderful book called Willamette Landings that, that discusses the history, the very brief history of the steamship industry or the shipping industry on the Willamette River. And, uh, you know, it's sort of combining that with the navigation, the Oregon Navigation Company, the landings, and then the various great floods, especially in the 1800s, and how those organizations and things shaped Oregon history and development. And, you know, I don't know uh, if the, Oregon Historical Society has done anything on that in particular or not, but it seems to me that that's a very interesting uh, topic that most people know very little about. And we do cover some of that in our experience uh, Oregon uh, exhibit because obviously water is part of the Oregon story and ports are part of the Oregon story and uh, the economic development and travel from the ports. So we haven't done a, I can't think of an exhibit we've done in my time that's specifically focused on, on that, but uh, a good idea. I just want to say, uh, Carrie has done such a fantastic, this Angel Palato, uh, has done such a fantastic job with putting the Oregon uh, Historical Society on the map. I mean, it was always there, but I mean, really making it visible and um, I'm a member and I'm also going to the lecture series, uh, which are wonderful. The people he's brought in, historians who've, who've written wonderful books. So I'm giving you a plug there, Carrie. You're I appreciate that. Just, you're, I, uh, you wrote, you said that just like I wrote it for you. So. <laughs> uh, Phil Levinson here. Uh, information to supplement reviewing your home in neighborhoods in Portland, you know, going to your library and i guess you have to call and set up an appointment to go in and gather the information just say yeah that hopefully that's going to end you know soon as the re, as the restrict covid restrictions lessen we just want to make sure that people are socially distanced so a, a supplemental source uh is the Multnomah county library in the reference room they have reverse phone directories that you can look up by address and find out every person who's ever lived in your house. Awesome. Do history research on those people. And just to know that prior to, I think about 1932 or 33, Portland was East Portland and West Portland. So the address you have in your home now was not the address it was in 32 or 33 and prior. And there's a cross-reference directory for that. There's a great question here from Terry, and uh, I wish I knew the answer, Terry. says, my question is, why do you think we can learn from Oregon's history to help us with our current houseless, homeless crisis in the city and state? 
I, I guess I, I take optimism in the fact that, you know, uh, things can, things can improve and do improve. And we, we learn from our mistakes. Uh, obviously, I mean, as, as I tell people, and as I told uh, you in the presentation that was mentioned earlier, uh, when Oregon came into the union in 1859, we came in as the only state before then and the only state since then that came into the union with a constitution that specifically banned African-Americans from living in that state. Uh, a lot of people still amazed to, to hear that and what people regard now as a progressive state. That, that provision remained largely unenforced, but it remained in the constitution of Oregon until the 1920s when it was finally removed by a vote of the people. Uh, and so obviously, uh, we, you know, we've, we've, we've improved and gotten better. Uh, we, the, uh, the end of the, the talk we give on, on racial history in Oregon is a picture of a young protester holding a slide and, or holding a sign in one of the protests after, after uh, Black Lives Matter. And the sign says, Oregon has a racist past, let's not have a racist future. And so uh, that's a goal we, we all have. And obviously we need to set a goal of doing something far, far better when it comes to uh, homelessness here in, in Portland. Hey, Carrie, I have a quick question. This is Bob Lloyd. Um, I think you know that um, Salvation Army closed White Shield and we had that for a hundred years. Yep. We're conveying that to the Portland Japanese Garden probably this next month. You know, and when uh, we went in and to clean out the property, we found materials going back to 1897 um, and some things that might be of interest to you folks. How, what's the best way to get material to you for consideration if you want it or not? Have, absolutely. Have uh, somebody send me an email and I'll connect them with uh, the right people here, the experts in that who will, uh, who will help. Yeah, I'm also curious, generally speaking, who do you have that writes stories um, when there's a topic of interest? How do you find somebody to write those stories? To write them on our website or to write their, or how do you mean write? Yeah, write well, for a, for a presentation that you're doing or for a display, who writes those stories? We well, we've got a we've got a great staff here, uh, and so most of it is done here by by, by our staff. So, Kerry, it's not every week that we have a past Jeopardy champion here speaking with us. So, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't at least ask about that a little bit. Uh, I'm guessing there might be a story that you could share with us. Uh, a little bit about that experience you went through or something behind the scenes or anything? Well, it was, it was so much fun. I had watched Jeopardy since I was a little kid when it was on in the daytime and Art Fleming was the host for those of you old enough to remember that uh, before it became a nighttime syndicated show. And uh, it, when I was on, I was, it was back when I was working in Washington, D.C. and working for Senator Dole. And uh, it was just, you know, won four times, lost the fifth. Back then, I would have had... It, they limited you to five times. If you won the fifth game, then you came back for the tournament of champions. But probably the most surreal moment of my life was I was in with Senator Dole working on a speech one time and uh, all of a sudden into his office walked former President Nixon, who was in the Capitol uh, visiting Washington, D.C. This was some you know, 20 plus years, almost 30 years after he had resigned. And uh, I looked up and I said, oh my God, it's, it's Richard Nixon. I'd never, <laughs> never seen him before. And Senator Dole, when you got up, shook his hand and said, President Nixon is Carrie, he's my speechwriter. You had speechwriters when you were in the White House, didn't you? And Nixon said, well, of course I did. And Senator Dole said, well, bet you didn't have one who won $40,000 on Jeopardy. And, <laughs> and, and President Nixon said, I watch it all the time, sit down and tell me about it. So I said, here I was, Carrie Timchuk from Reedsport, Oregon, talking with Richard Nixon about Jeopardy. What were the odds that, that would ever happen? And I... Uh, I, I joke that I should have said, I'll take disgraced former presidents for 300, please, Alex. Uh, but, <laughs> but avoided doing that. So I did go back in December uh, for Senator Dole's uh, service. Uh, he, of course, uh, passed away after a remarkable life at, at, at 98 years old. Um, I had uh, you know, worked for him full time for six years as a speech writer in DC. And then for the last 25 years since I returned to Oregon, I continued uh, my connection with him, helping him with a number of books and continued to write speeches and op-eds for him and in regular contact with him. And, uh, you know, his, his loss, uh, although not unexpected given his age, 98, 
and that he had stage four lung cancer still hit me hard. He was such a part of my life for the last 30 years and just brought back the thought of what politics needs to return to. Uh, where bipartisanship, as you said, was not a mortal sin and compromise was a good thing and not a bad thing. And seeing him and his relationships with the Democrat leaders, where they would trust each other, talk to each other, never lead each other astray, disagree with each other, yes, but never try to you know, do anything underhanded, always understanding that Congress had to move forward and that, that six, you know, progress only happened with, through compromise. And that's what uh, Senator Dole believed in. And boy, do we need that now. Uh, and, and the civility and the decency of, of politicians like him and Mark Hatfield, uh, boy, could we use that. So. Well, that's- a little, little editorial comment there. Sorry about that. So yeah. No, I appreciate it. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Carrie. I appreciate you uh, taking the time and sharing your stories. You have some incredible stories and experiences, and uh, it's been fascinating learning about everything that the Oregon Historical Society is, uh, is doing right now and has plans to do in the future and all the programs that you guys are involved with. Uh, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I think uh, I speak for everybody. We could sit here and listen to your stories all day long. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, so just I would, I would be I'd be guilty of malpractice if I didn't remind everybody that membership in OHS is a great thing, uh, relatively cheap. Uh, of course, anybody because of the levy that was passed in 2010 and renewed twice since then by the voters, all Multnomah County residents have free admission every day of the year to, uh, to OHS. You can't beat that price, but by becoming a member, you also get the OHQ and uh, early access to tickets and that type of thing. So I would encourage everyone to become a card. You get a membership card that says card carrying Oregonian. So what, what's better than that? So, and thanks <laughs> for awesome. all, the good, the, the, all the good work that Rotary does. And maybe when you guys hit an anniversary, we could have an, we could have an exhibit here uh, honoring uh, the Portland Rotary for all that they do. Uh, we would absolutely love that. What an honor that would be, Carrie. Thank you so much. And, uh, and again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, next week, we will again be virtual. We'll be joined by Rotarian PSU Professor Harry Anastasio, who will be speaking with us about the crisis in Ukraine. So be sure to tune in on Tuesday at noon on Zoom. Don't forget to register for our in-person meeting that will take place on March 1st back at the Sentinel. And again, I want to thank everybody, all of our members for joining us here today at our meeting. And of course, thank you to all of our guests joining us here today. If anybody has any questions about Rotary membership, please don't hesitate to reach out for more information. Carrie, you would be an honored member. We would be so pleasured to have you join our club or anytime you have time, you're welcome to join as a guest to uh, listen in as well. And a big thank you to Tom for today's reflection. Thank you so much to Carol for the presentation on the work that we're doing on our International Services Committee. And uh, thank you so much to Curtis and our Enterprise Academy Committee uh, for everything that you all are doing on the upcoming Enterprise Academy in March. Be sure to sign up for that. They're looking for volunteers and it's a phenomenal experience, uh, both for our volunteers as well as the kids, of course. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody behind the scenes today for today's meeting. A uh, big thank you to Skyler, uh, to all of our committee chairs, to all of our members for everything that you do. And of course, once again, Thank you so much, Carrie, for your presentation today and for taking the time to be with us. As we close today's meeting, let's all remember why we're here. We serve to change lives. Let's continue to focus on the lives that we change and continue to step up and to do the right thing. Thank you all for joining. This meeting is adjourned. Ding.